Hello, everybody, and we begin with our double parasha this week, the parasha of Kedoshim, which uh, contains many different mitzvot and wonderful things. So just hold hold for one second while we let some people into the room, and we will begin. Welcome everyone coming into the room. So the Sedra opens the first of our two Sedras with a description of the service to be carried out in the tabernacle on Yom Kippur. Aaron, the high priest, would offer a bull as a sacrifice for atonement for himself and his family. And then the next step in the service was to select two he goats, one that would become a national sin offering and a second that would represent all the people's sins. And that second one would be pushed over a cliff in the desert. The sin offering is offered up, and then after a special offering of incense, the remaining he goat is brought near, and Aaron le leans his two hands on its head and confesses all the sins of the children of Israel. He then sends the goat to the desert with a designated man. Aaron then immerses in water and then offers up his own elevation offering and an elevation offering for the people. Hashem now tells Moshe about Yom Kippur. The rule is then given that offerings must be slaughtered and their service performed in the sanctuary area, while non-sacrificial animals may be slaughtered anywhere except the sanctuary area. Next, we have a prohibition against eating blood. The blood of a slaughtered animal must be covered with earth. The Torah then relates a series of forbidden relationships prohibiting incestuous and illicit relationships of different sorts. There was an idol called Molech, Molech. And it was very prevalent in the land of Canaan to worship Molech. Molech. The Israelites are told not to sacrifice their children to Molech in the way in which the Canaanites did and not to profane the name of God. There's also the prohibition of sodomy and bestiality. The Israelites are told that the land is holy and that their staying in the land is contingent on them keeping the laws. And that is the first of our two parashas, Acharemot. Second parasha is Kedoshim. The name Kedoshim opens with the command to the Israelites to be Kadosh, which means to be holy. The laws that follow may give us some idea of how the Torah presents the idea of holiness. The first law, following the imperative to be holy, is to fear one's parents. There are also the commandments to keep the Shabbat, not to worship idols. Following this, there's another law about sacrifices. And then the Torah says that we should leave the corner of our fields when we reap in order that the poor people can take the food. There are a number of similar ways in which we are told to leave food for the poor. One of them is that we shouldn't gather the fallen fruit of our vineyard. Stealing and lying are prohibited, as are swearing falsely by God's name. Uh, there are many other ethical prohibitions, such as those against cheating one's fellow, robbing, uh, delaying the payment of a worker's wages, cursing the deaf, placing a stumbling block before the blind. You have to be fair and unbiased in judgment. You shouldn't gossip. You should prevent the death of your fellow, and you shouldn't hate your brother. There's also the famous mitzvah of loving one's neighbor as oneself. Following on from this, there are laws about forbidden mixtures in various contexts. There are also other mitzvahs, such as the prohibition against sorcery and the commandment to stand before an elderly person. It's prohibited to mistreat the convert. There's also a list of punishments for re forbidden relationships. We're told that our existence in the land of Israel is to be contingent on our moral conduct. And then the end of the parasha reiterates the imperative of holiness and mentions some of the principles of Kashrut. I'm just going to stop to let some people into the room. And now let us unpack some of the inspirational ideas from this parasha. The parasha, as we mentioned, talks about Yom Kippur. And it's not really Yom Kippur yet. So it's interesting we sort of figure, the, the engage with the ideas in the parasha, the parasha. Yom Kippur. 
But that's not that time of the year, but the ideas which are there, the underlying ideas are ideas which are relevant all year round. And one of the things Yom Kippur is about is fixing our mistakes, is undoing the bad, the wrong that we have done. And there's an interesting piece from this week's parasha, which sheds light on this. The Kohen Gadol, the high priest, had a special set of garments for Yom Kippur. All year round, he'd have eight garments, which would be woven from gold and wool. But on Yom Kippur, he would have four special garments, the turban, the shirt, the pants, and the belt. And they were made of simple white linen. And the law was that Aaron would need to remove his linen garments after his service on Yom Kippur and store them away. Rashi explains, store them away for how long? Store them away forever. He would never use these items again, these, these pieces of clothing. Every year on Yom Kippur, the clothing that he would wear would have to be new. Why is that so? Clothes, which are only worn once a year, could surely be used for many years. Why were they put away in a new set of clothing required every year? Surely there's a message over here in the capacity for renewal. Because in the course of the year, so often we get stuck in the grudges that we have, in the hatred that we feel, in the envy that we experience, in the bad habits that we acquire. And the vital message of Yom Kippur is I can start anew. I can start anew. And there's a power in Yom Kippur which allows us and inspires us to do that. But it's a message which is relevant to us every day. I can start anew. The idea of Yom Kippur, most powerfully expressed on that day, but not limited to that day, is I can become a new person. So the clothes that I, I, the Kohen Gadol, wore last Yom Kippur should not be brought into the equation because now I'm a new person. And it helps us to reflect on the mistakes that we make, the things that we do wrong. I remember once hearing from the previous principal of Selwyn House. And he said, I don't want to say that your children should ever fail. But I do hope that your children will fail. I hope that they will. Because if you don't fail in life, if you don't have your downtime, if you don't have your struggles, you don't grow. You can emerge on the other side if you tackle your problems in the right way. And so when we, when we encounter mistakes, when we, are, when we commit mistakes, when we do things that are wrong, when we get stuck, we can take a step back. We can ask ourselves the questions. What did I learn about myself from this? What did I learn about what's important to me? What did I learn about how to make better choices in the future? What did I learn about other people? And just as that applies to our own mistakes, so too it applies to our, the way we view other people. People in our lives, people who we know have done things they shouldn't have done. Rabbi Nachman of Breslov teaches that sometimes the way that we look at other people can be self-fulfilling. If we look at them as having a certain flaw or a certain attitude or doing something wrong, if we view them in that way, sometimes it can end up that they will behave in that way. To have a positive outlook on someone, that can raise a person's level. And that is the first idea which I wanted to share today. Second idea. We have a story in the Talmud which says that someone, a, a convert, a prospective convert, went to Rabbi Hillel and said, I want to, you to teach me the whole Torah while I'm standing on one foot. And Hillel said, OK, I'll teach you. What you wouldn't want to be done to you, don't do to others. That is the whole Torah. The rest is commentary. Go and learn it. And this story, according to many commentaries, is referring to, Hillel is essentially referring to a mitzvah which appears in this week's parasha, the mitzvah of Vahafta l'reacha kamocha, and you shall love your fellow as yourself. And Rabbi Akiva taught that this mitzvah is the klal gadol Torah, the great principle of the Torah. And according to many, that's what Hillel is saying. Treat people, don't treat people improperly. That's the whole of the Torah. How can that be the whole of the Torah? 
I understand it's very important to love other people, not to treat them badly. But how could Hillel, Rabbi Akiva, describe this mitzvah in such grandiose terms? I want to share an, an answer, an answer of the Katav Sofer, who explains that nobody can keep the whole Torah. We have 613 commandments, many of them not applicable today without the temple, but even the ones that are applicable today, no one Jew can keep all of those mitzvot. Some mitzvot are only for Kohanim. Some mitzvot are only for people living in Israel, others just for women, others for Levian, Levites, others for men. But if one feels a connection to one's fellow Jew, if one feels a love for one's fellow Jew, then you have a connection to the mitzvah they are doing. By associating with them and caring about them, you have a portion and an association with the mitzvah they are doing, and they have, through their love of you, an association with the mitzvah you are doing. And that is why, explains the Katav Sofer, by Jews caring about one another and feeling a bond with one another. They gain a connection, not just to the mitzvot that they do directly, but a connection to the mitzvot that all the Jews do, a connection to the whole Torah. It's a beautiful idea and helps us to reflect on the connections and associations we have with our fellow Jews, and also on the way in which each of us play a different role, and everyone's role is important in contributing to the whole. There's a story told about the town of Brisk on the night of Yom Kippur. You know, in Brisk, they didn't used to have a Kol Nidre appeal, but they did their appeal for tzedakah on the day of Yom Kippur. And what would normally happen would be that after, Yom Kippur, after the Yom Kippur davening, the rich people would go home to bed. After all, they had to be awake for the appeal the next day. Then they would be giving lots of money. If they fall asleep, they're not giving, they're not going to be pledging much money. But the poor people would stay and they would see, they would say to Hillim till late at night. And if they fell asleep, well, they were not able to give that much to the appeal, but they contributed in a different way by adding their prayers. The rabbi of the town was Rabbi Yosef Dovalevi Soloveitchik, and he saw one year that a rich person had decided to stay behind after the prayers to recite to Hillim. Rabbi Soloveitchik went up to him and said, you must go to bed straight away. After all, the Talmud says that if one of the choir members in the temple decided to leave his role and instead to become a gatekeeper, then theoretically speaking, he should be guilty and deserving of the death penalty. Similarly, if a person was normally a gatekeeper and decided they wanted to become a choir member, just walked out and went to do a, diff do a different role, that person would be deserving, theoretically, of the death penalty. And so, too, you have your role, said Rabbi Soloveitchik to this rich man. You think you're supposed to be saying that to Hillim now, but if you understand what you have, what you have to give, your position is to do something different. Your position and your duty is to go to sleep now so you can give generously tomorrow. Doesn't this seem rather extreme, rather rigid? Why can't the person just get up and walk in a different lane? Imagine if there's a war and the Air Force is involved in the war and the Navy is involved with the war. And right in the middle of the war effort, the pilot decides, you know what? I think I want to be a ship commander. And he goes off to try to work in the Navy. We need you. You can't do that. You're undermining the war effort because you have your skills, you have your experience. Walk in your lane, understand what you can do. And every person's contribution is valuable. We had a guest speaker a few months ago, Rabbi Pesach Krohn. Rabbi Krohn mentioned an idea in the Zohar that there are 600,000 letters in the Torah corresponding to 600,000 Jews who were present at the giving of the Torah. Because he explained the Jewish people is like one big collective Sefer Torah. And he said, if so, if we are to accept this metaphor of the Torah scroll for the Jewish people, then we can derive three great lessons. Lesson number one, it's our obligation to bring everyone into the Torah, 
to bring everyone close. <clears throat> we need every single Jew to be engaged with their Judaism. And if there is one Jew who is left out, we are flawed. Just as if there's one letter missing from the Sefer Torah, it is not kosher. Lesson number two, we have a law that if two letters touch in a Sefer Torah, then the Sefer Torah is not kosher. And this teaches that no one is exactly alike. There's no overlap. Everyone is important. Everyone has their role, which can't be played by someone else. Because of, not just because they are a man or a woman or a Kohen or whatever it is living in Israel, but because of their particular experiences and talents. Every person has that bit of light, that kind of contribution, that position to improve the world that no one else can do in exactly the same way. And lesson number three, in the entire Torah, there is not one word that is only one letter. And that teaches that we can't live alone. We all need one another. We need to be together. If there's time to hang on, just one more idea before we close. The idea of love. We told the story already of Hillel. That which is hateful to you, do not do to your friend. This is the entire Torah. All the rest is commentary. Go and study it. And we explained the understanding of the Katav Sofer as to how Hillel could possibly say something like that. But I want to share with you the explanation of Rashi. Rashi gives two explanations on this. The first one is that most of the commandments applicable to us today are to do with how we treat our fellow person. So whilst it's true that we have different mitzvot of Shabbat and Kashrut and so on, which are not directly about how we treat other people, most of the laws are. And that's what Hillel meant. But Rashi then gives a second understanding, which is very interesting. He says, what does it mean? Don't do to your fellow what is hate hateful to you. Who is the fellow? Who is the friend that's being referred to here? His answer is the friend is not your fellow man, but God. God is also your friend. And just as you treat your fellow human being as you would like to be treated, so too you should engage with God in that way. Just like you would not like to be ignored or disrespected, so too you must not ignore or disrespect God, but engage with him just as you would like people to engage with you. I find that a fascinating idea, a fascinating angle for approaching our relationship with God. Perhaps indeed the idea is that the Torah does not have two separate legs, how we treat God and how we treat our human beings, but the foundations are intertwined. One has human friends and one should view God as a friend. And Hillel's cryptic response allowed him to underscore the importance of both. So thank you for joining us today, either in live or watching next week to learn about Acharimot Kadoshim, about how we learn and grow through our mistakes and view others who make mistakes, how we understand that everyone has their role and how the love that we have for human beings also extends to God. Thank you so much for those who join us today. And we wish Shabbat Shalom to Nancy, to Carol, to Hannah, to Vivian and to Diane. Shabbat Shalom and well, shalom. we'll be with those watching next week.